Welcome back to MS1016. Now that we know the laws of thermodynamics, I want to extend our understanding to how they are related. Before we moved into lecture 4 proper, I wanted to take some time to review a couple of concepts that we've already gone through. We've dealt with three laws of thermodynamics so far. The first law had to do with conservation of energy, where the total amount of internal energy is equivalent to the amount of heat and work combined. In the second law, we explored the concept of order and disorder and the leveling of energy in a system into equilibrium. The third law states that entropy is zero at zero Kelvin. I'm going to touch very briefly on something known as the zeroth law of thermodynamics. The zeroth law states that if A is in equilibrium with C, B is in equilibrium with C, hence A must be in equilibrium with B. Now, we call this the zeroth law because it was written after the first three laws were written. It is, however, applicable to calculating the first law. Hence, we put it before the first law and called it the zeroth law. It is interesting to note, however, it is also beyond the scope of this course. There are also two equations, which we've introduced you to, that you should be familiar with by now. How internal energy relates to entropy and how enthalpy relates to entropy. Here, I'm going to introduce you to the concept of free energy. Free energy is largely defined as the amount of energy that is available to do work. We will start by talking a little bit about Helmholtz free energy. Helmholtz free energy is defined as the amount of free energy of a system doing work at a constant temperature and volume. It is generally given in this particular equation and is given the symbol F. From this general equation, we can integrate all the values to from df equals du minus tds minus sdt. How can we relate Helmholtz free energy to the first and second law. Let's start here, which relates to the second law. If we remember, the second law equation is listed as something like this. This can rearrange to dq equals to tds. From here, we can substitute this into the differential equation for the first law. And from here, we can substitute the first law equation into the differential form for Helmholtz free energy. Putting it all together, these two terms will cancel off, thereby giving us this relation to the first and second law, df is equals to minus pdv minus sdt. Here, I want to introduce you to another very important term for free energy known as Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy defines the free energy of a system doing work at a constant temperature and pressure. You will most likely encounter Gibbs free energy throughout your entire career as a material scientist. Why? Because we assume work is done at constant temperature and pressure in many reactions. Gibbs free energy is defined with the symbol G and has the equation G is equals to enthalpy minus temperature 
times entropy. If we take the differential of all the terms, we end up with dg equals to dh minus tds minus sdt. How do we simplify this and relate it to the first and second law? If you recall, du equals to tds minus pdv is the first law integrated with the second law. tds is essentially derived from ds equals to dq over t. In a previous lecture, we defined dh is equals to du plus pdv plus vdp. And this allows us to do our substitutions down the line. We can substitute du into this equation and dh into the differential form or differential description for Gibbs free energy. From here on out, these terms cancel off. These terms also cancel off, giving us our final differential expression of dg equals to vdp minus sdt. To wrap up our introduction into free energy, let's go through the difference between the terms once again. The difference between Helmsholtz and Gibbs free energy is that Helmsholtz free energy is associated with constant temperature and volume, while Gibbs free energy is associated with constant temperature and pressure. They are both state functions because all the terms that make it up are state functions, and they can both be expressed in the following relationships, where df is equals to minus sdt minus pdv, and dg is equals to minus sdt plus vdp. So why do we even consider free energy? That's because it's more convenient, as opposed to considering enthalpy, entropy, and its interactions with all other kinds of thermodynamic variables. We consider a system in equilibrium if it has the lowest free energy. Notice I did not say negative free energy. In fact, an event or reaction will not occur spontaneously unless free energy goes negative. At equilibrium, free energy, like Gibbs free energy and Helmholtz free energy, is described to be zero. What happens when free energy becomes negative? Let's look at how Gibbs free energy reacts with water. At low temperatures, water is in a solid phase because at low temperature, considering this equation, Gibbs free energy is positive. They have the strongest atomic bonding and therefore the lowest internal energy. Enthalpy dominates. At high temperatures, however, Gibbs free energy becomes negative as the Ts term dominates. Hence, this leads to phases with more freedom of atom movement, such as gases and liquids, which are ready to spontaneously react with anything. Here, I wanted to introduce you to the concept of metastability. Certain atoms can be arranged in different ways where they can be stable at the same phase. Let's take, for example, diamond and graphite. Graphite is the most stable arrangement of carbon. Diamond, on the other hand, is not as stable as graphite, but is still stable 
as a solid. We describe it as metastable. We can convert diamond to graphite by crossing an energy barrier. If I put enough energy into diamond, say either by shaking or by breaking or by heating, eventually I can turn diamond into graphite. Likewise, we can turn graphite into diamond, the other metastable state, through high pressure and high temperature, which is essentially how we make lab-grown diamonds. Know that materials can exist in both a stable and metastable state.